Welcome to the IT Matters Podcast, where we explore why IT matters and matters pertaining to IT. Here's your host, Aaron Bach. Welcome to the IT Matters Podcast. I'm excited to be here today. We've got a great guest. Um, and before I introduce him, I want to call out that we are going through, I think, record highs right now for um, Charlotte, North Carolina. Yesterday, or actually two days ago, we we cracked 103 degrees from what I saw. So if you are in a part of the country listening, going through this heat wave, we're suffering right there with you. So I uh, hope everyone is enjoying their summer. We've got a great conversation today. So I'm going to introduce our guest. We've got Curtis Hughes, who is currently the CIO at Midrex Technologies based here in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I'm going to start off with, I'll let Curtis explain more and tell you a little bit about him, but I love Curtis's tag. He's got it on LinkedIn. You can follow him, but he says he's a digital leader with a passion for culture and people. Curtis, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Appreciate you having me here. Glad to be here. We're excited to have you. And I'm going to start off, I ask every guest who who comes on uh, this question. Um, but before we go through, I want you to kind of explain, if you had to summarize someone you meet new, you know, who is Curtis Hughes, specifically your, your I guess, in your professional and personal um, background, what would you want people to know about you? Yeah, first and foremost, uh, you know, dad and husband and, and, uh, and, and you know, lo- love my family and love that time. And so really just try to, you know, work hard, play hard kind of thing. And, uh, try to find the balance between those two. I think a lot of people coming out of post COVID and everything going on. I think that's, that's really important to people as well, but I really do kind of like my tagline says, I really do like to sit at that intersection of where technology and people kind of collide. And uh, you know, there's, there's everything today is digital and, and we'll probably talk more about that. And every company is a technology company, whether they think they are or not. And it impacts our people. And we're seeing that across the board, whether it's culture, engagement, how our how our teams can work, wherever they are in the world, flex, hybrid, hybrid work, all that kind of stuff. So um, I really like to like to work on projects, work on challenges and solve problems where, uh, where it really impacts people. That's awesome. And I know from talking with you before, you're unique. You're a little bit unique because you, you know you're right now. You're a CIO title, and a lot of people who end up in that role have been kind of working their way up. They were a director, they were a manager, they were on the help desk. You were actually in in an entrepreneurial entrepreneurial role. I can't even say that word today. Um, less in the last ten years. So maybe if you could share with the, our guests a little bit more about that at that point in your career, what you were doing, and kind of how you transitioned. Yeah, no, I mean it's um I, I I love the the consulting side. I've started a couple of companies and ran those, and uh, you know I, I said early in my career, and uh, I, I try to tell others this as well when I when I talk to them and people I talk to is I really tried my entire career. I was kind of one of these these people that wasn't defined by a title. Even when I was first coming out of school and, and software engineer developer, I was in, interested in what marketing was doing to sell the software or whatever it was. So I was just always interested in more than just my and for better or for worse, and I think it's actually turned out better where it, it's led me to all these different places rather than just putting a putting a you know a title on it. I'm a software engineer. I just love I love technology. I love how it impacts business. I love making businesses better. I love growing businesses. And uh, if I can do that with technology, if I can do that as a leader of an organization, I just I go where I see challenges. I like to build. I like to uh, I like to solve problems. And um, sometimes that's with technology. Sometimes it's not. So uh, yeah, I. Um, T- took kind of my consulting, 10, 10 plus years consulting, growing businesses, turned that inward on, on Midrex. I've been here for the last five years and just kind of pouring that into to helping Midrex grow and helping Midrex kind of transform from the inside out from a technology standpoint, for sure. How do you think your consulting background has helped you be a better leader, a better CIO for a technology uh, organization at Midrex? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, I mean, Part of it for me was I always loved being at smaller companies. Like I've never been at the huge, the huge organizations, you know, many, many thousands of, of, of people. Even Midrex is a fairly, fairly small organization. And, uh, I think it allows you to wear a lot of different hats. I like wearing hats. I don't like just wearing one hat. And when you get to wear, wear multiple hats and you have some experience across a variety of things, it helps you just understand when things come. You see things from a different perspective. And I think that's probably the best, the best word is perspective. All, all my experience 
up to this point, um, even though it looks like a winding road sometimes, I think it's been perfect to, for where I am today. And I, I'm an, I'm an everything happens for a reason kind of guy. So um, it's allowed me to have a, a unique perspective on growing it. I mean, a lot of folks that are in technology, especially probably don't think like a business owner, right? How do I manage cost? How do I do? And having that and grown a company, manage P and L, you know, had to hire people, had to let people go. You know, when you're starting a company, you're HR, you're accounting, you're everything, right? And so you're just having that perspective has allowed me to to take that. And when I speak with with our accounting teams or or anyone internally here as a CIO, it's it's just helped me connect with those folks more and just understand kind of what the problems they are that they're, they're having. Yeah, as a as a small company, you you are all of those things, but you pretend to be bigger, so you make email yeah. aliases for each one that all go back to you. So exactly, um, and you, and you mentioned sharing your perspective, and I know I'm excited for our, our guests to be able to listen to your perspective because I think you you really do approach you know technology and IT different differently the way you talk about it, and and you know a lot of people talk about the tech. So before we get down that road anymore. I want to ask the same question that I ask all of the guests. So, you know, you're in your CIO now, you know, you lead the technology department at Midrex, you've done a consulting for technology. What is information technology to an organization at this point in time in 2022? What does that mean? Yeah, I think it was, um, I mean, I'm a big quotes guy and I, I just, you know, I take bits and pieces here as well. I think it was Drucker that said it, and it was back in the 90s. He said, you know, we spent the last 30 years thinking about the uh, the technology, and we'll spend the next 30 thinking about the information or something like something to that effect. I'm paraphrasing. But I really do think it is. Today, we're, we're in the age of, uh, you know, data. And um, as much as there is technology, you know, d- data is huge. And um, I, when I think of information technology, I really do kind of center in on that information piece. And that was one of the reasons I came to Midrex. And um, Midrex has been around a long time, but but wasn't leveraging all the information and the experience and all the the learnings to to take that and pour it back into the organization and do things better. And so uh, I think we used to see data as uh, as maybe the exhaust, like hey, let's build all this technology and all this data comes out the end, and yeah, we don't know what to do with it. Today, data is the fuel, right? We take that data and we pour it into things to kind of to kind of drive it. So it's it's a huge shift, and I to me, I think that's that's one of the the most powerful things about information technology today in organizations. And you, you talked, so we're going to come back to this because you mentioned data three times, I think in that conver- in that, in that snippet, but this is kind of a hard question maybe to answer, but how does date? So when we talk about technology, we're talking about the data, we're talking about the systems behind it, but you always talk about as a person, people are the crossroads, people are what drive it and people is what really is driving the change. Why do you say that? Like, how does people and techno- like I, information technology, how do they relate? And why is pe- why are people so important to it? I mean, people are what organizations are about. And people do, you know, companies do business with people and not, not companies and not technology and those kind of things as well. I think people, that, people are at the heart of everything we do. And so I think it's easy to get lost in new shiny technology, even data and, and, and KPIs and all these things. But at the, at, at the end of the day, you know, I continue to, I'm not always perfect at it, but always try to come back to why does that matter? So what? I've heard someone tell me, ask me that before, like always ask, so what? Like, yeah, great. We've got all these KPIs and we've got all this data. So what? What does that, like, what do we do with that? Does that help somebody do something better? Does that give someone insight that makes them change their strategy on how they recruit new employees? You know what I mean? What, what are we using that data for and how does it impact it? And that's what, that's what's powerful to me is I've got all these, these tools over here, my garage full of tools here's the problems that we're trying to solve as an organization, as people, as departments, as, as a business, how do I go over there and get my screwdriver, my hammer and come over here and, and, and try to solve that instead of just walking around with a hammer saying, Hey, I've got this technology. What problem can I solve with it? And I mean, the old ad is right. When you're, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So I, I really don't ever try to leave with technology and really try to understand like, what are we trying to solve here? Like, what are we trying to do? So we're going to pivot a little bit, Curtis. Uh, I, I want to go back a little bit in your career. How did you actually get started in technology? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, it depends on how far you, you want to go back. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think I was always one of those kids that, like, I mean, my parents would drove them crazy, I'm sure. And now my son, I see this in him as well. I like to take things apart. I like to figure out how things worked. And so, um, you know, all through, you know, school and high school, especially, you know, you know, you ought to look at technology computers. I was like, ah, it's okay. I enjoyed working on computers, that kind of thing. It was good paying jobs for sure. And um, so that's what I did. I focused on computer science and 
and um, went, went to school, got a computer science degree from here in Charlotte, at UNC Charlotte, and uh, came out, you know, at that time, um, mo most folks that came out with a computer science degree, you were, you were basically a software engineer, you know, writing, writing software. And so that's how I started, is building software, but thankfully got into the company that was a small, growing startup. And so I was able to, uh, you know, like we talked about, wear a lot of hats. And that led me to things I really, I think it's really a benefit um, to see what you really enjoy. You know, I enjoy this. And so I moved from from writing software to, to architecting to designing, you know, UX and, and interfaces and things like that. So I've done everything from, you know, user interface design to um, to building out full products to writing software across and then leading teams and then growing from there to leading teams of, of software engineers. Did you always want to be a CIO at some point or did that just happen naturally or by accident yeah, yeah i think it I, I mean i don't i don't think there's i mean if you know me personally you know i don't think there's any accidents so uh you know i i don't think it was an accident but um it was never something that was like you know a, a, a milestone i had always said when i had my own company like hey if i wasn't running my own company that's probably the right the right fit because i loved i don't want to just sit and, and write code or i don't want to sit and just just do that i like the variety that comes with you know, the business side, the technology side, bringing those two together. And I like to sit right in the middle and I think it's a, it's a perfect role for that. So it kind of just evolved and I knew, I knew what I enjoyed. I knew myself, I knew what I was good at and knew, knew what I enjoyed doing. Yeah. So we talk on this podcast a lot about IT matters. Obviously it's written above my head. What does that mean? So why IT matters and what are IT matters? And so when, what we mean by that is, you know, we talked about, you know, you defined information technology, but so let's talk about why IT matters. You're a CIO at a midsize uh, manufacturer with in an interesting place in 2022 with the political climate and you guys being international. So why does IT matter to Midrex? Like, why is it an important function and why is it going to continue to grow in, in importance at Midrex? Man, that's a huge, a huge question. I think if you look across the board at most organizations, and, and I think I said it earlier, is that you know every every company is a tech, technology company, right? And they're, they're, everything's so digital these days. But certainly, technology helps us do things better, faster. So automation's a big piece of some of the things we're working on now. What what used to be you know five people doing something manually now, and it, and it's not it's not necessarily about removing jobs. It's about putting that unique talents of those people on other creative work that a computer maybe can't do and automate, right? But the things of, you know, that happen the same way all the time, how do we automate those things and make us more efficient so that we can scale and grow our company um, maybe without having to add a lot of headcount sometimes and we can grow and do new things. So I think that's a big piece of it. But also one of the areas I'm really interested in is, is really, you know, again, that intersection of people. So like how does technology help us engage with our teammates more so whether it's, you know, internal enterprise social network kind of stuff, even looking at things like sentiment analysis and how do we stay, you know, with pulse, you know, at the pulse of, of our teammates and especially with hybrid work and how do we bridge that gap and stay connected with our teammates when they're halfway around the world and we don't see them that often or ever, how do we use technology to, to, to close those gaps? And I think, I mean, that's been one of the amazing things to see over, over COVID when people couldn't and they, you know, adopted Teams, Zoom, all these kind of things. We were using Teams before before COVID hit, um, thankfully. But um, I think I think there's a number of ways, and uh, and and I talked about the data piece too. And we're we're doing a lot more with data now, where we're getting data from from plants and looking at that, and and helping us develop new products and and our R and D and how we design these plants and do it differently. You mentioned automation, and I think people hear that they hear it on the Super Bowl commercial at halftime. That everyone talks about automation. If you would be so kind, help us understand, you know, within Midrex, for example, give an example of like where automation, when we talk about it, like give a real life example for our listeners so they understand like, what are we automating? I think some people just think it's like this made up thing that just data runs through a robot, but it's not. No, I mean, there's, there's a number of them. I mean, I think something really simple that people will, will get is, I mean, when, when we came, when I came in, you know, a few years ago, I mean, every every computer, and again, we're not, you know, we're not a Bank of America huge company or anything like that, where we've got, you know, tens of thousands of computers to deploy, but still a, a number of, of computers and things like that, refreshes, building all those by hand. So someone going in, you think about setting up the operating system, installing the software, that takes a lot of time. It takes a person almost full time building those things out, staging them up, 
automating that. So, so going to things where these automated builds to go and it, it deploys our software based on who you are in the organization. So if you come in, you're in accounting, you get this software and that there's ways we can do that. Another area we're using it a ton is on the security side. So with security and a small team like ours and, you know, all the threats that are out there, just because we're small doesn't mean we don't have the same threats. We act, you know, people out, you know, the bad guys don't care what size you are. They're just coming after anyone. And so how do we look at, you know, threats and things that come through and, and sift through the noise? And so automating some of that and even using things like artificial intelligence, machine learning to figure out what, what's good, what's bad, so that we can quickly sift that out and say, yeah, we, we know that that's not, you know, that's not something to look at, or yeah, this person never does that on their computer. Why are they accessing that server? And so we've used automation in that way so that from a monitoring standpoint and security standpoint, so that we can see kind of what's going on within the organization. Yeah. So you have an organization right now of, we'll call it a mid-sized organization. I don't know exactly how many employees, but if you could go around to each person and, you know, you mentioned automation, how everyone is using technology two questions and you can kind of go which, whichever way you want here. One, what do people, what do you think people not understand about like the IT department and technology? And what do you think, what could, if you could talk to each of them and sit down and say, you know, please know this or please consider this, what would it be? Yeah, I think, uh, I think a lot of times, you know, one of the things that I think people maybe don't understand about technology is, is you know, I kind of call it the iceberg effect, right? You see the 10%, but there's all this stuff that goes on behind the scenes. So just, just to keep everything running and what goes on to, to help, you know, computers run and all the software work, I think that's a big piece of it, right? Just helping them understand all the bits and pieces that they go into it, but also helping them connect the dots. I mean, that's something that I really try to do a lot of here. We hold town halls, we hold tech cafes every month, my team, and talking about new technology and, and why it matters. So we talk about these things. And I think that's probably one of the best places to start um, is, is to talk about it. Don't make IT some black box over in the corner where, you know, where it's just no one knows what kind of goes in and out of it. Why does it matter? What are the things we're doing? Why are we looking at data and launching new dashboards? Why does that matter to, to accounting or, or whatever? And I think it really, it really impacts them and helps them do their job better if they know why, why we're doing certain things it certainly helps change happen better, right? When someone knows the why and kind of what's in it for them. But I think I think also just, uh, you know, if I had to sit down and let them know about, you know, th things that IT is doing, I mean, really my goal, my goal, my team hears it all the time is invisible IT. Like, I don't think IT should be something that's visible. Like the best, the best technology is invisible. It just works. I mean, we all use things and, you know, whether it's iPhone or whatever it is, and I actually have a KPI and measurement and we actually measure in kind of like an invisibility index. So based on tickets and things like that, like how visible is technology to our teammates? And uh, and I use that to kind of gauge and we and we change directions and do different things because, you know, no one comes into the office to, to uh, use Excel or Outlook. They come in to solve problems and to do certain things in their group. And, and, you know, for me, technology should get out of the way and just help them do those things better. So I think trying to trying to make sure that. Um, that we we're always, you know, as invisible as possible, I think is one of the things that I, I like to do. Yeah. I'm going to, I want to drill into this a little bit more because I've not heard the invisibility index. So you actually track how visible it is, how, like how many, is it, how many tickets, meaning like if there's less tickets, that means that more invisible you are. Yeah, that's, that's the key. I mean, tickets, walk-ups, things we hear, things we get through our tech cafe. So I try to have a lot of touch points. Like we do, we do, um, you know, walk through, talk through kind of things. We walk around like we, we have all kinds of things. I push my team like out of, you know, get, get out of your desk and talk to folks and, and try to learn. So we're always talking to the business in, in different ways. But yeah, certainly tickets is one of those. But but every ticket is not obviously, you know, something that's visible, something maybe just be a question like, hey, where do I find something or whatever it is? Like they could be all kinds of questions. So certain types of tickets. Yeah, we try to track that and say, this is something that shouldn't have shouldn't have been there, right? It's something that was visible that what should have just worked. And so we, we try to track that. I wouldn't say it's perfect by any any stretch, but half the time and half the battle is just the intentionality around, you know, let's let's start using this terminology and let's try to understand and let everybody on the team try to work to make technology invisible to our teammates. And uh and it, it changes your behavior when you just even think that way. It's interesting. I feel like there's a lot of people out there that might want to uh want to take that metric and and 
and talk to you about it. So I'll, I'll let them hit you up on LinkedIn because I think it's a really fast. You hear shadow IT, and I think we've all heard shadow IT. I've never heard invisible IT. And yeah. I guess so. You know, you you were you already talked about you were consulting for you know ten plus years. Now you're in a, you know an organization running IT. How do you think things have changed when considering big projects? So like take a product officer or take a man, a plant manager right now where you're at. Like ten twenty years ago, I assume decisions were made. IT was sort of an afterthought. Go do it. Make sure this works. Blah blah blah. I feel like today things are a little bit different. You have to consider the technology aspect of it. So how has that changed from what you've seen from your consulting days, where, where you're at now? Like, how do, you, how do you have someone who might be in charge of something who doesn't have a lot of technical expertise consider IT well? Like, what do they do well to make sure that it goes, that the technology behind it is thought through properly? Yeah, make, make sure I understand the question. So I think, I, I mean, I really think that, uh, that you have to uh it all goes back to i mean technology like it like manufacturing anything else it's there to solve a problem and and really i mean that's you know probably people get tired of me saying it but to me it really comes down to being that simple like you know whether you've got a technical background or not and trying to understand i think a lot of times you know when technology was coming up yeah we were using it to solve problems but it was it was heavily focused on the technology now there's so many aspects to it and especially how it impacts impacts the, the people and uh even today we hear, we hear the term you can call it whatever you want to but uh you know retention and hiring and those kind of things as well but i think i mean i think to me it goes back to solving solving the problem and what are we trying to do to solve the problem what what new problems do we have that we didn't have that we didn't have before and companies have to i mean look they have to keep a competitive advantage and they have to continue to uh to grow and adapt to that. And I think technology can help them, can help them get there, get there faster a lot of times. Yeah. So you would agree that organizations that take a step back, ask the question, like what problem does this solve when we're making a technology decision? You, you've seen those organizations do IT better. I mean, is that, would you agree with that statement? Yeah. And I would say the companies that, uh, that consider really that focus on i mean we hear it all the time people process technology i mean data is in there as well but used to say it in our in the consulting days i mean spend you know 80 20 kind of thing right 80 percent of your time on your people and your process and 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 uh you know 20 percent of the time on technology because technology really is at the end of the day i mean i don't want to oversimplify it but it is the easy part like anyone can you know do technology you can implement certain technologies find someone to implement technologies for you but understanding how it impacts your people, short term, long term, what processes need to change? How do we need to do things differently? Do we need to change our business because of certain things that are happening and those kind of things? To me, that's like that's that's the correct. So when an organization comes in, you know, tool first, you know, technology first kind of thing versus someone that thinks about how it's going to impact the people, the processes, how we do business, uh, all the things around the, the edges. Um, I think they do it better for sure. Yeah. I've, we've heard it uh, a number of times before. Actually, a couple of things you said, uh, other guests have said, like you mentioned in, in a previous thought, highlighting what impact IT has had for others that don't understand it, the iceberg effect. You know, there's 10% they see, the rest they don't. Yeah. I think it's a great practice to help people understand this is what's happening in the background and, and allowing people to see, oh, this is actually what goes into this. But to your point, the planning behind IT, the impact of it, but what problem does it solve and how do we become more efficient? Before we move into like trends, I guess I'm curious in your personal life, because you've spanned across a number of industries, what technology personally do you, I guess, what technology do you like the most? What technology has changed your life the most and why? Yeah. Uh, you know, you got to, you know, there, there's hardware, there's software, there's all kinds of different ways you can look at technology. For sure, I'm I'm a I'm an Apple iPhone. It's really the only Apple I use. I use I use PCs, um, but my iPhone has probably transformed my life. I mean, it took so many things and put it in your pocket where I use, you know, calculator, music, whatever it is. And so, and today, just just how far it's come. And and I mean, camera. I mean, you know, I I I'm a big photography guy. I did full photography, full cameras, all that kind of stuff, kind of amateur photography. I mean, you can do so much on the camera on the iPhone now and don't even need like the larger cameras. So I think the iPhone for sure. But, you know, from a software standpoint, I think one of the things that I love, everybody tells me I'm, you know, maybe weird about it, but like OneNote, I'm, I'm a huge, huge believer in Microsoft OneNote 
it could be used Evernote and some other tools like that. But I've been using OneNote since about 2009. I would call myself a pretty pretty heavy power user of of OneNote and just organization, brainstorming, all kinds of ways to uh, to use that tool. And then I, I think the last one is just the, the new things that you can do a voice, whether it's Siri, whether it's Alexa. We we, we kind of go with the Alexa. It's a love hate relationship right now with Alexa because uh, yeah, some of the updates I think they push out on Alexa don't always uh, work the way we want them to. But uh, but it's it's great tools. I mean, it's got a lot of promise. The things you can do and driving down the road and you know speak to my phone and put something on my to do list for tomorrow while I'm thinking of it and not have to like write it down or try to remember it i mean that's pretty powerful stuff to be you know the ways we can use some of these technologies my kids like using alexa too they like yelling at it as loud as they can to play uh winnie the pooh and disney uh songs over and over and over so no thank you for sharing so let's let's kind of transition over to some of the trends and what we're seeing in it so you know i guess you mentioned in um, in a previous thought, you talked about cybersecurity, automating it, talking about tasks, onboarding and offboarding. What trends are you seeing in, let's talk about Midrex for a second, through the manufacturing industry. What trends are you all seeing in IT that are going to matter now and in the future? And and I can guess one, I think, from what you've said, data a number of times, but I'm curious to dig into these a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a number and I wouldn't say they're, yeah, I mean, they, they've been out there. Um, you know, they've got different levels of adoption across the organization. I would say we're still trying to get our hands around some of these. But certainly, you know, how do we use AI, machine learning, those kind of things for these plants? I mean, some of these plants that we have running for um, 30, 40 plus years. So we, we don't own and operate the plants. We build them and design them and uh, for other customers. But using that data to help us know how, how certain components uh, that we design from an engineering standpoint function in certain locations and geographies around the world. And that we just, you know, using data to do that. What about predictive maintenance, knowing when a component may fail or something based on it's in, you know, the Middle East in the desert versus, you know, uh, some other place that's very cold or whatever it is. So I think using using that m- more to really understand and, and, and learn more about the data and the plants and how they kind of operate. And then kind of going into that, there, there's a term, um, a lot of people have probably heard it, but th- this concept of a digital twin, right? So you have a digital version of a physical, you know, automotive has been using it, manufacturing, steel. I mean, steel is always a little bit slower to change, but really in steel and manufacturing as well, like having this this virtual model that's the exact counterpart, right, of a twin, if you will, of a physical thing. So while we've got the physical plant and we used to send people over to look at the plant and see where something was leaking or whatever it is, now, how do we take that, get get real-time data, overlay it on the 3D model of the plant, and we can see this living, breathing, like, you know, plant uh, here in Charlotte, you know, seeing it on a screen and how it's operating and how it's functioning and, and what's going on and being able to, to see how it reacts and run simulations. That's one of the biggest things is, you know, hey, what if we change this or, or reduce the diameter of this pipe? Well, that makes it – you can do all that in real time because you've got a, you know, a, a virtual representation. So that's – that's a big piece, I think, especially around what what Midrex is trying to do. That's changing a lot of um, a lot of what we're doing. You mentioned so you mentioned the ability to have a digital twin. I actually am not that familiar with uh, the concept of a digital twin. So, if you don't mind, just for the for the folks that haven't heard it, like me, what do you mean? Elaborate a little bit more on like digital twins. So you have a physical plant. You have obviously the digital copy of it. What else can you do with a digital twin? So yeah, you have you have the you know you designed it on 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 software right, and so you have the model, you have you have a, a a digital version of it, and then you have the physical plant that's running and and sensors in the plant that, that I mean you could have vibrations, you could have temperature, you could have you know sound, whatever it is, speeds of motors and all that kind of stuff. So the data is coming off, it's flowing now into the actual onto the screen right, and and so you can see on the screen instead of just like yep I designed that you know compressor. Now you can see, well, that compressor is running at this many RPMs or whatever it is. And and then what's nice is once you have that and you have real real data coming in, then you can run like what-if scenarios like I just talked about where, you know, hey, what if we change this or reroute something here because this new plant needs to do something a little different? Well, how's that going to change how this thing runs? You don't have to guess and try to go through and set up big, you know, you can do it all right there because you've got data and you've got the digital representation and you can see how the how that will function and automotive like i said been using this for for years and you take you know wind tunnel data and they can take the digital twin and shape the car i mean all kinds of stuff like that but um you don't need to travel as much you can 
you can be much more proactive around how you make design changes, um, predictive maintenance, like I talked about. So that's, that's, I think that's one of the powerful things about it for sure. And, and I assume that's what's driving, you've mentioned data a number of times, like that's what's driving the amount of data increasing in the reliance on data because you're getting more real-time data of real-time processes that maybe we haven't had before. Is that, is that true? Yeah, exactly. And obviously, the more data you have, the more you can train and learn from that data, right? And so um, data is becoming very important to get data. How fast can we get it? You know, even data that, you know, hey, it's great. We used to be able to get data and we could get it in batches, you know, once a week. Well, now we need it daily or now we need it hourly to try to get it and to see these things, these things more frequently. So um, it's pretty interesting. I mean, I think the latest, latest Gartner stat as of 2021 was that, you know, it's great but only 11% of businesses have, have really deployed digital twins at large scale, right? And so it's still, you know, some of the larger organizations obviously are doing it and doing it well, but it's still, I mean, what, 10, 11% of organizations out there that are that are implementing stuff like this. So I think that's a pretty big thing that's going to help us in the future for sure. Yeah, that's a low adoption rate. So it seems like, so when, when you go to like a, you know, a, a conference for your industry, is everything, you know, is it all about, automating sensors, how to get the data from these sensors. Is that kind of the trend that you're seeing or is there other, you know, technologies around there? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the big things right now, if you go, I don't go to a ton of the iron and steel type stuff. I go, I, I go to a handful. Um, but a lot of it right now is around uh, for the industry decarbonization. So, I mean, steel, making steel very dirty, very bad, you know, traditionally for, for the environment how do we how do we reduce carbon footprint? How do we you know decarbonize you know the steel making going to green steel and things like that? So Midrex is smack in the middle of doing that. So that's a big push. But also, I mean, every magazine I get on on uh, you know iron and steel, and that, I mean, it's huge sections in there around AI, machine learning, digitization, sensors, just like what you talked about, like data and and predictive and all, all the ways that we can help things run run smarter and they can learn. I mean, you can have assembly lines and and you know steel mills change how they run based on, you know, no one having to program them, but they just learn. They learn that when this happens and this time, whatever it is, and um, it's pretty powerful when you can have, you know, technology start to learn from itself and start to uh, start to change how it operates. It's like uh, 1984, a little scary, but I, I guess yeah. that's where we're going. So exactly. changing the subject just a little bit, but it's kind of related, right? So you're talking about very, I would say, cutting edge trends in your industry. But then you take like the traditional, like what people think of IT and it's the help desk person, it's the person fixing the computer. How does someone start in a career in IT? Like where would you tell them to start now? And like, how do they learn about, you know, AI and digitization and digital twins? Like how do they get there to have that knowledge to properly do this for an organization like yours? Man, it's, it's, it's a good question. It's changed a lot since I, since I came out of school. I mean, when, I mean, I look at it now and, and, some of the folks we're hiring and, and in school and things. And, and there's so many paths you can take with, with technology, right? And uh, I mean, you can go into data science and, and you know, business intelligence and, and, and all that and data analytics. Like I said, when I came out, it was like you're either a software developer or you're building the hardware. You're like a computer engineer or computer science. And, um, you know, you build the processors or you build the, the software kind of thing. And now there's so many areas, whether it's machine learning, AI, you know, like I said, data, still writing software, user user experience. I mean, there's full jobs that are just designing the interface if you like the marketing. So for me, it really is like, I mean, it's true as they say, do something you enjoy. So like, I mean, find, find the things you enjoy. And honestly, there's a technology element to nearly everything that we can do these days. If you love marketing and designing and drawing, I mean, you, you can do that technologically. You could be on the front end of designing, take your pick, right? And anything you want, whether it's software or not, and really finding out what you're good at and kind of, you know what what things are what things are hot right now um but there's also so many more ways to get like learning and certifications whether it's linkedin learning or these other ways like there's so many ways to, to get up to speed on stuff that just didn't have all those options back when i was coming out it was you know you, i mean literally you grab your book that looks like this off the shelf and and you're, you're reading it at night or, or whatever it is to try to get up to speed now so much is on uh you know the internet learning i mean people can people can get certified in you know ai and machine learning in, in a short period of time or data or whatever it is so um and i think i think probably for a lot of people you got to try things out i mean that's why i like wearing a lot of hats i got to see what i liked and what i didn't like i things really quickly that like yeah i didn't like i didn't like being on the front lines and like supporting and help desk ticket stuff i like building and kind of creating behind the scenes 
everybody's going to be different. Everybody's going to kind of figure out what they what they enjoy most. It's really interesting. So you just said like there's a number of uh, there's a number of sources out there that you can go, you know, the you know YouTube, Internet, you know, whatever to go get the answers. I was listening to a podcast the other day about a guy who's in finance and he was talking about he started in 19. I think it was like 86 or 1988 or something like that. And his boss walked in and said, I need you to do blank, 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 blank. And he said, the the phenomenon that went through my mind and, the, and what raced through my mind about how I, how little I knew what he just asked was so much more severe back then because I couldn't just go to Google and type in oh, what no. he asked and figure it out. I had to literally think through it, ask colleagues, go find a book, or just admit I didn't know it. And so the yeah. amount of you know, like you, you can only fake it so far if you didn't know it. Whereas today, I think we can, you know, go out and Google, read a quick article and become an expert. So, and, and I, I agree with you. It's really, you know, do what you're passionate. Uh, one of our last guests, his whole, his whole mantra was, you know, you bet you have to have passion for what you're doing, but uh, for what you do. But, and I think that applies to any industry. If let's say the CEO of your organization, or, you know, you're making a prediction, I want you to you know, kind of look five years, 10 years out, right? And someone says, hey, Curtis, what is our IT department going to look like? What are things, what changes are going to happen in 10 years? And what like, you know, and, and you could talk about the trends that will get us there and the why. Obviously, this is just a prediction, but like, what do you think will change? And wh where do we think IT departments will be in 10 years for like a manufacturing organization, for example? I think, uh, man, that's that's tough. I try not to crystal ball too much, but uh, I mean, you got to kind of stay on top of this stuff. Um, Indulge I, me a little bit, if you will. Yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I think I think we talked about some of it already. I think things will continue to be automated. Th things will be continue to become commodities, right? I mean, even the IT. Uh, I mean, even the help desk. I mean, it's something that I've been looking at here. Haven't made a ton of progress just because it hasn't been high on the on the on the list of things that we we're tackling right now. But even with uh, some of the topics we talked about, you know, machine learning and, and things like that. You could have a machine that, that answers 50, 70, 80 percent of the tickets that come in because you've already most of them you've answered before. Right. Most of them are repeat things or something. I mean, a handful, you know, it's the 80, 20, right. 20 percent are probably new problems or something like that. And it continues to learn. So what about a, you know, a bot or a series of bots out there that, you know, these these you know, software bots that, you know, answer tickets and, and get rid of the help desk and put those people toward other things that are, like I said, more creative and kind of the, the building of things versus the, the, the tactical. That's really a big focus of mine is like, if it's something that's just very, very tactical, we can automate it. Let's automate it. Let's get, you know, automate the administrative is kind of what I say a lot of the times, like getting rid of all the things that take someone, because it's not only takes time, but it also you know, people that enjoy building and they're doing all this administrative work kind of, you know, grinds on them too and can lead to burnout and some other things too. So I think letting letting the automation kind of take hold, I think is a big a big area that we'll see. And then in general, I think we'll just see things become more and more connected. So, you know, getting data, you know, we're already seeing it. Like we get data from 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 machines and we can see things early and detect them where we couldn't before. So even you know, telemetry from from some of the, the laptops that we've got out there and stuff that we've deployed, we can start to see problems and see things going on before someone even knows it's an issue and stuff. So how do we how do we connect all these these pieces to um to again get back to invisible IT and just help things help things run run better and get things uh get things out of the way. It'll be interesting to see how hybrid and you know this this work anywhere and you know whether or not that that sticks and you know are we going to swing back and everybody's going to come back in or is it is it really going to go i don't know this depends on who you ask i think these days yeah we don't have to make that prediction because i know that that's controversial in organizations right now <laughs> a, a funny test for anyone at home that you know to, to what so one thing curtis said that's really interesting if you ever want you know he mentioned about more things being connected if you ever want to play a, a fun game at home with your significant other, whoever you live with, take a guess on how many devices are connected in your house. I remember my wife and I did it and I said, you know, there's only 20 or 20, you know, 30 devices connected. It was a lot higher than that when we ran the actual uh, test and it was kind of crazy to see how many things were connected. So a uh, fun game for all the listeners. Curtis, I really appreciate you being on. I want to ask you one final question that we ask all of our guests and this is really your state of the union. Curtis Hughes is giving a state of the union in front of a million people and you are leaving your best advice, uh, whether it's about, you know, in career advice, 
technology advice for those who don't know, any kind of advice as it relates to technology, what would it be? What would you say? Million people. Wow. I, I it can think, be, you know, it can be a billion people. It can be as many people as you want. I, I think, a, I think a few things, maybe, um, number one, expect the unexpected, like think, think, things are no longer, you know, success, number one, success is, is not linear. And if you look at, you know, my, my background or my history or whatever it is, and just, and just how, how the, the world's going. And I mean, COVID and all these things have proven that, right. Just expect the unexpected and kind of balancing to, you know, what you're working on today with, with kind of where we're going tomorrow, but also being, being agile and adaptable. I think, I think it, the more rigid we are, the the worse off we're going to be in the future. I think we really have to bake flexibility into everything we're, everything we're doing. I talked about it already, but, you know, kind of starting with the tool first mindset. I think that's, I mean, really, I, I say a lot, people that know me have heard it a, a ton, but don't start with the tool, start with the problem, start with the people and, um, and really try to understand that first because and, and honestly even when i'm hiring i mean looking at people technology is going to change skill sets are going to change what i hire somebody for today they're going to need to know something different in five in five years ten years whatever it is or, or even sooner so um you know h- hire for culture hire for people hire for the ability for someone to kind of think creatively and solve problems outside of just uh just technology and then the last thing is just always keep in the back of your mind and or, or the front of your mind the impact uh, that whatever you do has on people. I think sometimes we just forget that. We just solve problems in technology and we don't think downstream, like how's this gonna affect someone that uses this or someone on my team or how do we support it? Even, whatever the people impact may be, think about the people impact um, of what you're trying to do. It, it'll be much more successful when you when you do that. And it'll make you think differently. I love it. And I, I really do appreciate you sharing this with with myself over the years and then with our with our listeners. I think embracing the people, understanding the technology and the why behind it is super important. And, and this seems to be a theme on, on this podcast. So, Curtis, I want to be respectful of your time. Thank you very much for, for joining the IT Matters podcast. This was awesome talking to you de- today. I always enjoy it. Uh, for those listening, uh, what's the best way to get in touch with you? I think LinkedIn. Just find me on LinkedIn. Yeah, I think it's slash Curtis Hughes on LinkedIn, and you can you can look me up. Or just you know, there's not a ton of Curtis Hughes out there, so uh, find me pretty easily here in Charlotte. But yeah, it's probably the best way. Well, thanks for joining us today, Curtis. Stay cool. Uh, really, really enjoyed the show, and uh, have a great week. Thanks, Aaron. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening. The IT Matters Podcast is produced by Upcala, an IT advisory firm that helps businesses navigate the vast and complex IT marketplace. Learn more about Upcala at opkalla.com.